Louie, first of all, welcome to the 700th, 700th episode of my show. I don't know if you knew that was going to happen. You didn't. No, why would I know? I know, no. I didn't prepare you for that. Like, so, like, it's, I, I'm putting you in the position to celebrate me and my success for a few minutes. This is the 700th, 700th episode. You keep having to say it both ways. Seven, well, is that proper to say it's the 700th episode? Sure, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm excited you're here, but it was a surprise coincidence. And uh, yeah, well, thank con- you. Well, maybe congratulations. Should... Thank you. Yeah, let me say that before you say thank you. <laughs> no, I thought I would set it up like this. If I go like, uh, I really appreciate you coming yeah. and doing my 700th episode. That means a lot to me. I'm glad you were able to make time. <laughs> like it was planned. <laughs> right. Lou- no, Louis- listen, I, uh, uh, I'm very proud of you. You've done... Um... I don't think you can do anything 700 times unless it's working. No. You know what I mean? No, well. Do you think there's 700 of anything that was just shitty? Shit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm plenty sure. of thousands. Yeah. Trillions, trillions of Most things. things. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Boy, you fell down those stairs fast. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I am very proud of you. Thank because, you, Because uh, this is a very meaningful thing that you do. I mean, you've... Uh, had a lot of really important things going on in this garage. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And now Big you, deal things. The president yeah, was there. You know, Robin Williams. He was. I was at his house. That one. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, by the your podcast. Okay. All right. I'm what? Trying, I'm trying to say something nice. Here. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's great. I made it's some. Uh, thank you. Great, Keith Richards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alu Bell. Alu Bell. <laughs> Did you really do Alu Bell? See, that is a great thing. It's the greatest. The people that you've brought yeah, together under sure. one thing. It's really something, man. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they've all done it. We've, they've all, yeah. you know, it's weird. I, I actually had some notes that I left inside. Hold on. Okay. He's actually leaving. He just left the garage. I'm alone in the garage. He left. He's in his house. And, uh... Okay, I'll play a song, I guess. It's... Okay. Well, well, well. Oh, hi, okay. I remember when you played guitar publicly. Publicly, I can't talk today. At the Montreal Comedy F- Festival. I'm really fucked up. My brain's fucked up. You remember you did Cunty McShitballs? That's right. Cunty McShitballs. And I was like, what? Wait, why is and, and everyone loved it. It's the only time I ever played guitar on stage I think and I and I witnessed it yeah people went crazy on, right yeah, yeah and you brought your guitar to do it I remember I no I did is that possible no I wouldn't have taken my guitar to that was that. the that was the night in Montreal where Bob and Dave did the far, farting Gary thing That's wasn't it, it? farting Gary <laughs> yeah everybody was there <laughs> yeah Dom Dom Marrera was yeah. the host right and I and I, it was amazing and I think you just made up that song yes. right it was like the ballad of Cunty McShipballs. That's right, and everyone thought it was amazing. Yeah, whatever, man. Yeah, I don't what? know. I think it was kind of no. It was. I, I remember feeling really high after. Really yeah, because happy. just because you sang and played guitar. Yeah, that that yeah. Right, that feels good no matter what happened. Yeah, the bit was that uh, I went on and I, I wore a suit. Right, and I did the jokes I had then that were very sort of Seinfeldian. Five, right, five minutes on Letterman. Clean, right, clean jokes. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was doing good, but I, we had pl- planned this thing. So I had people planted around the audience. I remember one of them was Jeannie Garofalo. Yeah. And as I'm doing my jokes that are lo- landing solidly, people yeah. start yelling out, Conte! Oh, that's right. Conte! Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like ignoring it. People want to Conte! Conte! Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I get upset. I go, listen, I used to have this stage name, Conte McShitballs. Right. And I right. used to come out and play the guitar and do a whole character, and it used... But I want to, I want to be a mainstream comedian now. I want to, <laughs> yeah. I want to be clean and be on Letterman. I, right. I don't want to be trapped in this thing anymore. And they're just chanting Conti, Conti, and then even the audience who didn't know about it <laughs> yeah. started chanting it. Yeah, and then I rip off the suit and I'm wearing this black T-shirt and I and somebody hands me a guitar. Right, right. And I sang this song. My name is Conti the shit ball. Right. They, oh, that's so. Wait, remember when no one knew who you were? You could that's do right. things. I could do. You stuff could do like secret that. things. Yeah. But you did. I you actually did that with the with the Horace and Pete. Now here's the deal with that. Yeah. For me. Okay. 
Because you came in here and we had a long conversation about Horace and Pete, and I was sworn yeah. to secrecy. We sat in this For exact an hour. spot with even the microphones in front of our mouths without and tape you were rolling. Like, you're not taping, right? <laughs> yeah. You're not taping. And you told me the entire process with excitement. Yeah. And you were you didn't know what was going to happen. That's right. And I then you were like, you know, I you, you can't say anything to anybody. Right. It was a big secret. And this, you didn't record this, right? Right. Right. And then like a day later, you're like, nah, we fucking should record. Should have recorded for it. later. Yeah. For any time. Yeah, it could have didn't have to play it. Top right secret. Away. So dumb. But uh but it was I was excited for you and I got excited and I watched your first episode and then I kinda slacked <laughs> and uh and I knew you were coming today. So I, I, I watched them all and I watched them pretty much back to back. Like I guess mm. I binge watched them. Mm. I was locked in and at the end I did not feel great. No, I can't imagine you would, yeah. <laughs> it's not a uplifting show. It's a down pushing show. It's the show. opposite. Yeah. It's the opposite of uplifting. Yeah. But but what struck me and I, I imagine what struck a lot of people <laughs> of what <laughs> like it was like it was there was it was so relentless yeah. and bleak in a way. But because people, I imagine, ask you, like, you know, is it a comedy? There's no way you can say it's a comedy. No. It's a tragedy. No. It's structurally a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's actually a very good observation, because a lot of pe people say it's either comedy or drama. But no, there's tragedies. The other oh, one. yeah. Those are the two masks there. Right. And yeah. it's and, and it structured that way. I it mean, is. You it know, is. It's a tragedy. Without hope. spoiling the end. Well, because there's hope. And hope is that, that there's no tragedy without hope. Right. Um. So yes, it's tragedy. But let's let's like uh, I know you went on Stern and it, you, right now you're, you're going to be doing a tour to to uh, promote it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it only went out to the people on your mailing list, and That's then right. we and the only people who like I retweeted, I talked about it on here. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a secret thing. That's right. Especially at the outset. Yeah. But the but the plan was always to do what you're doing now, which is to you're now like it's out, it's finished. I'm going to promote it. That's right. So the questions I have about it, like I, I don't want to rush or like I I, I have a lot on my mind. Yeah. Because I've known you a while, yeah. and w w my first reaction when I heard you that you know you were on Stern, you said you got into debt, and it was mm -hmm. like millions of dollars, <laughs> and everybody was like, uh, "Jesus, Louis, millions of dollars in debt." I'm saying, I thought, and I've said this to people, this behavior is not unusual for Louis. The amount is different. <laughs> That's right. Cuz I've always this, this is not this is how he creates. He just he needs to wipe the slate clean and be in complete financial fear and then yeah. he'll do something amazing. It was a plan. That's right. Right? But yeah. then just a higher uh, money amount. Bigger money amounts and also um you know, I just I I I figured that uh I I wanted to play with my own money here. I didn't want to mess around with other people's money because yeah. the things I was doing were going to be very extreme, you know? Not right. only the way the story was going to be told, but the way I was going to release it. Uh, everything I did was counterintuitive. Every and why would you want thing. to involve anyone in that conversation? Yeah, I don't want to have to, conf con you know, um, convince anybody of anything or risk their money when I know that I, I was taking a deep risk. Well, the thing, because um, you... Had not really, you know, said it. You, you just put your other show on hiatus. That's right. And and I imagine you had to have a conversation with Fox about this. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what did you say to them? Okay, so like I told uh, John Langraff at FX that I was going to stop doing Louis in May. I think it was yeah. late May, and I I just told him that I didn't know I would ever make another one, right. and that I might, right. but I needed to. I needed it to be okay if I never do. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to owe it anymore. Right. And it was a hard thing for him to hear. Yeah. And uh, it was unexpected. I had told him I was going to do at least seven seasons. Like, yeah. I kind of promised him that. Yeah. I'm only saying kind of because I'm ashamed at how much I'd really promised it. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I told him. I just creatively, that's where I'm at. And he respected it. Right. And then we made a, we, we renewed my overall deal there to make other TV shows. Right. Like Baskets. Yeah. Pamela's show. Yeah. These other shows. What's that going to be called? Better Things. Yeah. In the fall, it'll be on. They're producing it now. It's being made now. So I renewed that deal, and he gave me a big bump and more, you know, a better deal this second time around. To uh -huh. make. So I figured, okay, I'm going to stop doing Louis. I'll work on these other shows for yeah. FX yeah. and uh, see what else comes to me, you right. know? Yeah. So I did that, and then the summer happened, and I, I, I really cleared my head. Yeah. And... um. I'll tell you about this sort of why I made the show, but you asked one question, so I'll get to that. Once I decided I was making this show, the Horace more, and Pete, Horace and Pete. How how realized was it in your head? How when, did, I, when I talked to them about it? Well, no, just in general. So you you had that conversation, but you did okay. not have Horace. I had and Pete. no, I know, I had did no Horace and Pete in my head. Right. I figured I'm not going to do anything for a while. Right. 
And then, um, and then I'm having my summer and then I started thinking about what can I do for FX? Like I want to make something for them. Yeah. I started thinking of show ideas in general. Yeah. Um, one of them I thought of was Albert Brooks and me doing the the animation show. Yeah. And, uh, we're working on that. And then I started thinking about just shows I like and yeah. things. And I watched a thing called Abigail's Party. Yeah. Abigail's Party, you can watch on YouTube. It's like the only place to see it now. Yeah. Michael Lee, the filmmaker from Genius. England. Amazing oh, filmmaker. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. N- largely an improvisational filmmaker. Is that true? Well, a lot of his movies that are like real, like uh, Secrets and Secrets Lies. Secrets and Lies. And the, uh, the, oh, there's so many that were so good. Incredible movies. Yeah. Even Mr. Turner, the more recent one that nobody gave a shit about. Naked? It's Yeah, Naked. It's, oh, my God. So he made a, he was a playwright yeah. in the 70s. It's yeah. like he had this whole great career as a playwright in right. the 70s where he wrote plays. That's not, that's writing. Right. He wrote a pale play called Abigail's Party. Uh huh. And all it is is about four people in the suburbs of London or wherever in England. Yeah. Um, ha- their neighbors yeah. don't know each other and they have, um, they have drinks. Yeah. Two hours. Yeah. Of one scene. Four people and you watched drinks. a production of the play. Well, what it is is they did a play. They did a TV version of the play, and this right. was 1973. So it looked like All in the Family. Any show that was shooting back then, not Maud a, or something, right? But not unusual for British. I mean, they they That's did right. a lot of theater they did stuff like I think that. They did Pinter stuff. They did, yeah, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, Playhouse 90 or whatever it was. Right, and uh, but so they would. It looked like a sitcom, and that was, it was shot multi camera. You uh-huh. could tell there was somebody live switching right. the cameras. Right. And you have four characters talking. Audience? No audience. That right. was the thing. And it was right. funny. Right. I was laughing out loud and there's silence. Yeah. But it's not silence. It's like a state. It's a sound stage. There's a living feeling to it. And it's no. performed and you yeah. feel that you've seen a whole performance that never yeah. changed. You utilize that a lot in Horace and Pete. That's right. So 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 when I watched that, I was like, I this is doesn't exist in the American TV diet. It doesn't exist anywhere anymore no but here's the thing even playhouse 90 yeah the way that was produced was they'd take a play like a known play right you know eugene o'neill or something or sure. whatever and they take a known play and they would rehearse it for whatever probably weeks and weeks uh-huh. and hash it out the way that they dissect take a play and they dissect it whatever they do yeah, i don't yeah. know i've never been part of that process right. but i know it takes a long time sure um, but to me, the idea was let's, what if you made a series? What if you made 10 episodes of something like this, um, that has a hybrid? So it's episodic, like television. Right. But it's the medium feels like a play and yet also like a sitcom because it, it, it's, it, it'll look robust the way a sitcom, multi cameras, a right. decent set. Um, I started thinking of this, right? After yeah. I watched Elvis Hills yeah. Parnell and I just started turning on. Like my whole body, I got yeah. so fucking excited. Now, had you had conversations with theater people? Had you met Annie Baker at this point? I hadn't point? met Annie Baker. I was. What happened was I saw. I think you just maybe you just emailed. I her, saw maybe? the play, the flick or the other the one? flick. Yeah, the only one of hers I ever saw. And then you told me you had her on your podcast, right. and I was like, "Oh, I saw that play. That's a great play." And I thought I should reach out to her. Uh, cause I, I want to learn something from a playwright about yeah, this thing. Sure. Um, but I think I was already working on it at the time. I don't remember where I'm I Morris was. And Pete. The, yeah. I don't yeah. know where I was in the process. But anyway, I started thinking, of, I started thinking, I, I knew what I wanted it to feel like. Yeah. And I knew the idea of something that looks like a sitcom, the way a sitcom feels theatrical. Right. But with no laugh track, right. that already, a sitcom with no laugh track, I was like, bang, I want to see that. And also not the ex- expectation to be funny That's and not right. to write joke to joke. That's right. And then also taking from Abigail's party, two hours of talking, riveting, because you're really staying. Um, okay, like, so single camera movies, yeah. they move on the cuts. They move on mu- a big music cue. Yeah. Or a camera movement, right? Or the the ability to jump in time and space, which is something you weirdly take for granted in movies. Well, not unlike your show, right? Blue, On my right. show, sure. you're sitting, you're talking to a guy, you're yeah. watching a guy talk, yeah. and then within the same second, you're seeing something in another time and place, right? That's what moves single camera. Yeah, is the editing and the cinematography mm-hmm. um, in stage plays or in uh, multi camera worlds. No time jumps. No, really. you, you move on the dialogue and on the mo- on a moment, a person's mood shifting in front of you, in front yeah. of the audience. Yeah. Someone's saying something to somebody else and that changing. A piece of news being revealed. 
uh, a person entering the room. These, the, the, and also something accumulating, penting up for a long time. Yeah. I never played with this kind of shit before. Right. I never did it before and I got so excited by it. And yeah, when I saw the flick, I remember her, nothing happens in the yeah. flick. It's yeah. three people that work in a movie theater. One set. And they just talk. Right. With about big life pauses. and sometimes about each other. Long pauses. She writes them in. If the pauses. Look, yeah, if you look at her script, it's she all has a it's glossary all, of pauses. That's amazing. <laughs> like what what they mean in the script, how long each one should be. Mm -hmm. I think there's three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she was doing something that I had never seen before, and right. I took my 14 year old daughter to see the flick. Yeah. And uh, she's 14, and she watched. It's like four hours long. It's a few hours. Yeah, and two and a half maybe. I think it gets up to three. Okay, maybe yeah. Uh, so why did I say four? But it's, it's okay. three about three yeah. something. My 14-year-old daughter loved it. I mean, she's a bright kid, but yeah. even then, you know. Uh, Does that mean something? Yeah, it does. And so, okay. So, anyway, uh, I started thinking about this thing, and I'm like, well, what's it about? You yeah. Know? And uh, my buddy Dino Stamatopoulos was over, and he, he and I had talked about doing a show in a bar someday. And I thought, like, a bar is a good idea for mm. a sitcom. Yeah. Obviously, it's been done. Right. And then I thought, well, I want this thing to be a bar and a home. Two sets. Yeah. And I wanted them to be connected mm -hmm. so that you could walk from one to the other without cutting the camera. Because my first thought was we never cut. We never go. We never right. go. It's a one scene episode every time. That was my first idea, which I abandoned. Right. After like three. You know, there's none that are not no. one scene. Oh, really. Except no, the only, episode three is one scene. That's yeah. the only one that's one scene. Right. So anyway... Um, then I thought, well, why would there be an apartment above a, a business? Well, because it's a family business. They live upstairs. They work downstairs. Yeah. So that's how I got to family business. And then somehow the name, um, the names Horace and Pete just came. Out of nowhere? Out of nowhere. I I thought, who am I? I'm not me. I don't want to play me. I wasn't even sure I was going to be in it. Yeah. And then I started thinking about things like, I could do an episode that's three hours long. Sure. I could do an episode that's 10 minutes long. Right. I could do whatever I want, not on television, not right. on FX. I thought, I started testing this idea against everything that I, yeah, and you that I need, I'm required to do for FX, what their needs are. Yeah. Which are not, those are their needs. Right. Uh, the ad breaks. Yeah. Forget um, it. For, and it. Can't do it. Intermissions whenever you want. Right. But on this show, if I had to do an ad break every five, you know, four, five ad breaks, it. forget it. Having one episode that's an hour and another one that's 30 minutes, big problem. Right. Not as big on FX than anywhere else, but still a problem. Right. The, the language, yeah. cunt, cunt, nigger. I yeah. mean, I just knew I was going to fly around. Yeah. So I thought, and also then the main thing. I didn't want to promote this show, and I didn't want to give the audience a big head start. I didn't want them to smell it before they got to it. No expectations. No expectations no knowledge. at all. No knowledge or yeah. expectations. Right. That, forget it on FX. Forget it. So I go, I look, and I realize, well, in my, my overall deal, I've got an out. I can do something on my website. It's yeah. the one place I can do something else. Right. But that's because they think it's going to be a stand-up special or, yeah. you know, a cooking show with yeah. me and my mom. I mean, what, yeah, what yeah. would I do? Right. And at the it's time, website. Yeah. yeah. And when I started to conceive this, I thought this will be little. Yeah. And then I thought about a, a TV studio that I worked at for my show. I shot these David Lynch episodes in a TV set that's right. in the Penn Hotel in New York City. Oh, when he uh, was the uh, the network. The late night. The local. late night guru yeah. guy. Guru, yeah. 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 So I remembered that studio and I thought we could shoot there. And I, 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 got, I, got, I went a little crazy. I called my producer, Blair Briard, mm -hmm. and I said, uh, find out if the Penn Hotel is available for January. And uh, she said, okay. She called back and she said, it is, but we're going to have to put, if you want it, you got to put a deposit down, uh, whatever it was, $200,000. Yeah. I'm like, do it. Just put the money down now. I didn't have anything written. I didn't know who's in the show. Nothing. I said, grab the studio. But here's the thing. You wanted incentive. I'm smart. because yeah. Yes, because it, it was incentive. But since I took the studio, about five different productions offered us money to walk away from it. Because studio space is rare in New York City. Right. So I could I could have just speculated yeah. and made a profit on that money. <laughs> they would have paid the rent yeah. and given me like 50000 bucks just to walk away from it. Uh, but as it turned out, we wanted the studio. Okay. So... Uh, then I, Steve Buscemi called me. Yeah. Uh, we're friends. A Out of nowhere? He, he and I did a benefit together uh, yeah. for the mayor, uh, this made in New York thing. And he, he's a fire, he was a firefighter and he is very active in 9-11 charities. Yeah. 
So I asked Steve one day, hey, if you ever uh, give me an opportunity to help, you know? Yeah. So he called me and said, hey, we're doing this thing for the firefighters if you want to do it. And I said, sure. And then he said, how you doing? And we'd never really chatted. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm all right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> ah, Boardwalk Empire's over. Just sitting around. I'm like, oh, well, I'm doing all right. I'm writing something. We hung up. Yeah. And then I called him immediately back. I said, hey, do you want to be on a TV show with me? Yeah. And he's like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> And I said, meet me in New York tomorrow. Yeah. And I drove into New York. Yeah. He came into the city from upstate. Yeah. Were you out on the island? I was out on the island. Yeah. And I said, uh, I had the names Horace and Pete in my head. That's all you had? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, and I knew it was a bar yeah. and it was a family bar. It was starting to come together. Yeah. And uh, I said, I think maybe you're my brother. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I like that. Sounds good. Yeah. He said, I want to do this. I explained to him what I was at and I was like, it's for my website. I'm going to do it very cheaply. I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Yeah. I said, if you get another project, you can just tell me you can't do it. Yeah. And he was like, okay, I want to, I want to do it. And I said, if you want to have any ideas, you can tell me what they are. Let's just try to start doing this. So he said, okay. And then I thought we're Horace and Pete. And once I saw him and me as brothers, it, the lineage of the bar came to me really fast. I was like, it's a bar called Horace and Pete's. Yeah. And it's always been in the family. I like that idea. Yeah. But, but if we're Horace and Pete, why is the bar called Horace and Well, because it was always called that. Generations. Generations of Horaces and Pete's. I like that idea so much. So that's all you got so far. So I've got the ideas and I right. kind of know what I'm, I, th I know what I want it to be. And then, uh, um, and then I, I, I saw a picture of Edie Falco in a magazine. She's yeah. like one of those close up of her whole face mm -hmm. taking up the whole page. Edie Falco has stopped. Nurse Jackie is over. Like Boardwalk Empire is over. HBO's number one drama guy yeah. just stopped, and I got him. Now. Yeah, I've got him. Yeah, Edie Falco, Nurse Jackie, Showtime's number one comedy. Yeah, just ended. Yeah, uh, she says in the interview, "I love that episodic television. It's my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. I don't like movies. I like TV. Yeah, and I'm not looking for new work. I'm going to see what happens." And they asked her, "Would you ever be in a comedy?" And she said, "No, because comedies don't run deep enough." Uh -huh. And I looked at her face in the magazine. And I said, you're going to be on my show. I said it out loud like a psycho. And so then I wrote her into, I started writing. There's always the big test is, does it write? Yeah. I've had a million ideas and I sit down and I, nothing comes. So I sat down and I wrote the first episode and I got this. Oh, the other idea was joke. Does it write? Does it write? That's the yeah. way I look at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought about the other idea that I had loosely years ago was Joe Pesci should be in a sitcom. That was yeah. another idea I had. Joe Pesci should have a sitcom. And you met him, right? Well, this is before I'd, I'd never met him. Right. And so I created the character for him being Uncle Pete. Yeah. And then I thought Jessica Lang, uh, I, I sit next to her a lot at uh, award shows, so yeah. I like Jessica Lange, so I, I mentioned her- Just to, coincidentally? Yeah, well, because we're both FX people. She oh. was on uh, she was on a horror oh, yeah, hotel. That, yeah, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I told Steve Buscemi, what about Jessica Lange? He's like, yeah, I like her. She's great. Yeah. I thought about A.D. Bryant, because uh, when I'm on SNL, she's my favorite uh, cast member. I yeah. Don't, they're all great, but she's yeah. great. So I just sit down, and I put all these people in this bar- and I just start, I open the bar in my head. Figure out who they are. You don't really know who they are yet. I know that we're brothers. I know that she's our sister. I know oh. he's our uncle. Okay. I know who everybody is. Yeah. And I just open the bar. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah. And I just start writing what happens. And I just have a sand just shit to each other. I talked to Steve about his character. Yeah. We had approached the idea that he's a guy who needs medication. Uh-huh. And that he's writing that line and it's painful for him. And without yeah. it, he's in a violent place. And yeah. So I start writing and the voices are very fucking real to me. And the place feels very real to me. Um, and, and I just, it get, it got really intense really quickly. Yeah. And Uncle Pete comes in and he's hilarious to me and I'm just writing and writing. And then, she, and then Sylvia walks in. It's like it was happening and I was like a stenographer just taking down notes, you know? And uh, the first episode just was a very, uh, a, a, I don't know how to describe it. It was like an eruption, you know? Right. Um, and I finished it and I was like, God damn, I really love this. And you grounded everybody. The first episode, the characters are, are deep. They're, 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 they're three-dimensional. Yeah. And they live in the place. That's right. It all happens that first episode. That's the other right. characters come in, but I think what it, it, the sister, the daughter, the brother, mm -hmm. the uncle, and you... Primarily, that's right. You're dug in. Kurt's there and Steve Wright's there, but they're they're Kurt yeah. and Stephen Wright. 
I, Nick. Yeah, he's yeah. Nick. Mm-hmm. A little less than Nick. That's right. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, well, uh, there's a lot of things in, happening in this episode that um, don't feel like good first episode of a TV show ideas. Uh, like everybody starts really yelling at each other, and there's a very intimate. This is why you're writing. Yeah, there was. This is a very intimate and private. Um, yeah conversation right and a fight inside of a family yeah and if you don't know these people this family it's asking a lot of people to watch them in this kind of conflict immediately yeah i'm not saying a lot in the way of introduction about each person mm-hmm. and every time i thought of something like that i thought it, that this is what ha- this is what happened in this show for me this feels real and it's okay and i've got 10 episodes to explain everything and if people need to be told and fed everything right away they'll go away and that's okay with me right. this feels right right and um, and so I just kept writing. And at the end of the first episode, I thought, I didn't explain Horace at all. I really got Pete. Well, Horace didn't do anything. And I thought to myself, I have a feeling Horace is never going to do anything. And this is um, your character. My character. And I thought, when I thought of my character, I thought, I-, I did the thing of playing a divorced dad who's really showing up for his kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's your phrase, too, because when I had kids, you were like, you said to me, "This is you're doing great because I'd had kids for a while." Right, and I said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm a dad." And you go, and you said, "Yeah, but well, not all of us thought you were going to show up for this." <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that showing up is like an active right. for a man. Showing up as right. a father, right, is an act. It's a choice. Yeah, for a woman, it's a default. For, yeah. I mean, that's culturally, <laughs> right, you right, know, right. speaking. But so, I thought I played that guy who showed up for the kids and stayed in and divorce and. I want to play a guy who makes terrible choices and uh, and is a mess, you know, somebody who's distant from his children, who blew it with his kids. And also, the one thing I noticed throughout this whole thing, knowing you for as long as I have, is that, holy shit, this is unique. Louis listening a lot. That's right. <laughs> I also wanted to sit and listen to people. Right. I wanted to be somebody that people listen to. And I don't mean that, that as an that insult, listen, but I mean, but it's not yeah. your, that's not your natural way. It's not. That's right. You're right. And you were challenging yourself. Yeah. So... I wrote the first one and I thought, damn it, um, this is important and good and this is definitely what I'm doing next. But you were, you didn't ask yourself for, for meaning. You didn't require that from what you were creating. Cause like, you know, when you do something that's 10 episodes, it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, how you explained it as being inspired by theater, that all makes sense and, and your intentions all make sense. Right. But I, I assume that you wrote this not unlike other things. You let it happen. That's the and, way And did it. not, uh, interrogate it afterwards. Well, afterwards, yeah, but not during. Right. Because I don't write things like this with intention to tell people an idea. Or right. Like, cause I feel this, so I'm going to get to get skies it in a story. Right. Often when I write something, I look at it after and go, man, it taught me something or I learned something from it or not taught, but I, I, I ref- it made me reflect. Right. How many episodes did you write before you started the casting? Well, so, the so choices? I had, I had, okay, so I had written Steve. I re- Steve was in. Mm-hmm. I had got, started to try to get Joe Pesci to do it. I went to his house. You did? Him, yeah, I went to his house in New Jersey. Now, you're you're at a level now where people are like, you're, you're a guy. I can get folks on the phone, yeah. Yeah, so you go to Joe Pesci's house. I went to Joe Pesci's house. <laughs> and <laughs> That must have been great. It was one of the greatest things ever. Yeah, it was really great. And What's I already, I, by the time I wrote, I think I'd written two. And this is for Uncle Pete. Uncle Pete. Yeah. I'd written two. Yeah. And I started to know where the show was headed. Yeah. And I started to know everyone's backstory. I'd started to understand the family. I really knew them. And yeah, I didn't like have the sense of like, I want to say this about people. Right. I did tell myself before I started writing, um, something I want to think about when I write this show yeah. is that there's a tension inside of everybody between the safety of being alone yeah. and wanting to be with other people. That when the closer you get to other people, you get a warmth of community. Yeah. But you get scared. Yeah. Because they can hurt you. Right. Or you can hurt them and let them down. Which yeah. Which is just, just sometimes worse. And, and and sometimes you don't have control over either of those the, things. You never Ever. do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the other, but the safety of aloneness is 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 despair. It's very sad. Yeah. So every I always feel myself moving from to the person away from them move to the you know or towards myself away from myself right. towards myself. And that there's something interesting about that and that a family is that because a family, you have no fucking choice. Right. And uh, a bar is a bar and a family are the two opposite sides of that spectrum. You are you are fused to your family. 
but a bar is a way to be around other people where you're not with them. They don't, you don't owe them anything. Yeah. And I started going. It's to, also an escape. Yeah. That's and, right. That's and, right. And, From and, your own actual life. Yeah. And, and, and also like it's a place where, where, uh, you know, intelligence and things get compromised. Yeah. I mean, right. you're serving people liquor. So, that's right. so naturally there's, there's a slippery slope of, mm-hmm. of what's revealed and, and, and why people are there and all that stuff. And that's you, right. it's some of that you don't even have to speak to. And I don't necessarily think you did, but most of the people you covered. Yeah. So, so, so I started thinking about stuff like that. I started going to bars. Yeah. To see what it's like during the day, day drinkers. Like at one in the afternoon, I'd go to a bar. Uh, I went to McSorley's in Seventh sure. Street, which yeah. was really interesting because that's been in the same family since the 1800s. And so I learned a little bit about that if I talked to them. Right, you know? and the convict actually in the later episode uh, had worked at what was McSorley's. Yeah, probably really. right. Right. So uh, most bars I found they just have this, the music on and nobody can hear each other. This this conversation at night? of people talking or to during each other the during the day they just have the fucking music on uh-huh. so that people can talk privately and no one can hear each other. Right, right. And that was kind of disappointing. I couldn't really eaves drop on anybody because everybody was you know but you could feel it i could feel what it was like and i and also somebody sometimes somebody's at a bar and there's people with them that they're strangers yeah and they'll go like uh you know yeah i um um i, I my dad raped me and uh now i work in finance and people right. just kind of shrug you yeah, know, yeah because it's uh, anonymous you know it's it's it's, anon- alco- it's it's not alcoholics anonymous it's alcoholic anonymous yeah you know what it's I mean? active it's, like it's bar behavior yeah that happens yeah. so i got interested in that idea and then i thought of this thing of like hey if we make the show every week we could throw it up really f- if we do this multi-camera yeah we could if we can learn how to make a good line cut yeah. that you can live with um we could show throw the show up like the week we did it and talk about well, this is about to be an election year. I had yeah. no idea what kind of an election year we were headed for. Right. When I was writing it, right. I didn't know what the fuck this was gonna be. Yeah. Anyway, so all this was scrambling around in my head and I wrote a second episode. Yeah. And now I'm just walking around thinking about Horace and Pete all the time. And every time I finish writing, I'm very emotionally r- wrought. Like I'm I, it was affecting me. Yeah. And I just knew I had to do it. And then I went to the Emmys in September. Yeah. And uh, Edie Falco had a seat open next to her. She was sitting there with the seat open next to her. So I just sat down next to Edie. <laughs> and I said, uh, hey, we've met just hello a couple yeah, of times. right. I said, I'm writing a TV show. I want you to be in it. It's me and Steve Buscemi. And she said, sure. You know, like, <laughs> <"Can> I, <laughs> yeah. like, please go away. Like, I was freaking around a little, I think. I said, well, how can I get you to read it? And I said, I don't want to talk to your agent. I don't want to tell any, it's, I don't want to tell anybody it exists. It's a secret. And I'm not going to ask you to promote anything on the show. I just want you to do it. And she said, okay, well, I'll, she gave me her address where her mailbox is. Yeah. And the next one I got home from the, oh, so then I, then I turn around and there's Jessica Lang standing there. Yeah. And I asked her the same thing and Jessica was like, yeah, you know, I'll look at it. Sure. Yeah. Everybody was down. Yeah. And then, uh, when I got home, I gave, uh, I, I, I made an envelope with the scripts, just like the old days, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, Put my phone number in it and wrote her a letter. Dropped it at her mailbox place. Said, this is for Edie. She said, just tell them it's for Edie. Yeah. Gave it to her. Gave it to them. Two days later, I got a text that said, hi, this is Edie. I'm in. When do we start? <laughs> She's just like, I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, really? She said, yes, you absolutely. You sent her two scripts. Two scripts. Uh-huh. She was like, I'm doing this. And then I had lunch at Cafe Reggio with Jessica Lang. Yeah. And she said, uh, well, I hope you do more with her. The character, yeah, but I'll do it, right? Because I'd only written a little bit for her, so now I've got Jessica Lang and Edie Falco and, and Steve Buscemi totally committed, although just verbally, yeah, uh, to do the show. And then uh, Joe Pesci passed. And what was it like hanging out with him? Joe was—he's uh, a very raw human being. Yeah, uh, he gave me a cigarette. Yeah, and he goes. Uh, don't ever, don't ever let anybody tell you these are bad for you. That's a fucking lie. <laughs> like, he really thinks it's a lie. That cigarettes are bad for you. <laughs> and uh, I was at his. I spent time with his family, and uh, they, he takes care of them. Mm-hmm. He's a caretaker kind of a guy, but he's also fiercely protective of his privacy. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like being famous. Yeah. Um, and he's a good guy. I mean, I all I know is my time with him. I had a great time at his house. He's really hosted me nicely. Gave me a lot of advice. Very paternal advice. Uh-huh. Talk to me about the character at length of uh-huh. Uncle Pete, uh-huh. and it eventually passed and said, "You can have everything I've said to you." And Did it I, help you? Yes. There's a huge monologue in this show by Alan Alda, yeah, who plays his the part I had written for him, 
that is Joe said that to me about uh, going down on a woman about oral sex. Uh huh. Uh, and I just couldn't believe it when he said it. I was like, Joe, that's going to be in the show. And he goes, Ah, yeah, you can have it. <laughs> and uh, I sent him after he said no. I still sent him a couple of scripts, and he would call me and he'd go like, Listen, you fuck! Like he called me one day, you fucking. You dummy, you're going to write Archie Bunker again? This fucking character has no depth. He's a fucking idiot, and it's been done. So are you going to listen to me? I'm like, yes, Joe, tell me what's wrong with Uncle Pete, and he'd tell me stuff, and I learned from him. It was great. Anyway. So who, how many people do you go out to before you get all the... How'd uh, that work? Okay, after Joe, I went to Jack Nicholson. Uh, Jack Nicholson... Just because you felt like it? Um, I met him at Lauren Michaels' house. Yeah. And, um, Lauren's been very nice to me over the years. And he. Did he know about this project? Yeah, he did. He begged me to get, uh, financing from somebody. <laughs> but I said, I can't. He's like, it's not, no one's going to congratulate you for paying for it. No one. <laughs> and I was like, I know. I just don't want to have to talk anybody into the shit I'm doing. Yeah. And he's like, you know, they'll just give you money. There's people who just give you money. I'm like, I don't want to do it. He's like, all right. But so I asked him for Jack Nicholson's uh, phone number, <laughs> and uh, he <laughs> said no. But I'll pass something on to him. So he gave him the scripts. Yeah. And Jack uh, called me and said no. But when, he called when me. you got that, I call? get personal no's now. That's where I'm at. Right, but you, but your phone rings. My phone rings. Hello? And I, uh, this this woman says, uh, um, "I'm looking for Louis C.K." I said, "Who's this?" I'm calling for Jack Nicholson. If it's not you, I'm hanging up now or something like crazy like yeah. that. And I was like, yes, it's me. <laughs> so Jack comes on and he just says, I just wanted you to know the writing is terrific, but I'm not going to do it. Um, and I was like, oh, well, you know, can I convince you? He's like, you know what I did today? I went out to the tree in my yard and I sat under it and I read a book. And when I was done, I went back inside. <laughs> and I was like, all right, it was nice talking to you. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we chatted for a while, but yeah. he said no. And then I thought of Christopher Walken. Right. And his agent is also um, uh, Edie Falco's agent. Yeah. And Edie, uh, uh, Edie's agent had been sworn to secrecy. I'm really impressed, by the way, with all the agents of everybody. These are all yeah. Hollywood agents. None yeah. of them told anybody about the show. Yeah. So Edie's agent, Tony Howard, yeah. gave the script to Chris Walken who said that he really liked it, but that he thought it was too easy for a guy like him to play this part. Right. He's done guys like this. Yeah. He said, why, tell Louis, why don't you get somebody who you would never expect to do this? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I could see that. And she said, how about Alan Alda, said Tony Howard. And I said, I don't think so. She said, why? And I said, I think Alan is the greatest. Yeah. But he's not right for this. And she said, well, meet him or let him read it with you. I go, I'm not going to do that to Alan Alda. I either hire Alan Alda or I leave him alone. Yeah. She said, Alan loves to work. And I'll give him the script. Just let me let him read it. So I she's said, doing sure. an agent's job. Yes. Yeah. So he read it and he wrote me an email and he said, I really love the material. I'd love to talk to you about it. And if it's not right for me or I'm not right for it, I'd love to find that out as quickly as possible. Right. right. Let's talk. Yeah. So he came over to my house. Yeah. And uh, he's a great guy. Yeah. And he's really serious and into his work. Uh -huh. He's a real artist. Yeah. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to see Uncle Pete in him. Yeah. Uh, I was like, so how would you play it? He's like, I don't think about it that way. I don't intellectualize it. I just start doing it. Like he wouldn't tip his hand. <laughs> right. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> I said, how's this guy yelling all day going to go, uh, uh, you, uh, cocks is n niggas and piss ants. Like <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah. Not, it's not him. <laughs> Alan Alda is not yeah, that I'm guy. Like, He's not that guy at all. This it could be a, a huge mistake. Yeah. But then I'm looking at him, I'm like, Alan Alda's in my house. Yeah. I love every single thing he's done. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And he wants this. Yeah. And so I said, let's just do it. <laughs> and he went, really? I said, yeah, I want you to do it. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. Yeah. And he left. And then Tony called me and said, Alan's concerned. He says <laughs> you gave him the part, but he doesn't think you really want him to do it. I said, I want him to do it. And so... Anyway, I could, I'm talking too much, but I had, so I had all the big four. Yeah. Steve, Edie, uh, Jessica Lang, and Al Alan had him cast. But he hadn't done a read through. Hadn't done a read through. Hadn't done, I, at this point, I had read four. I had given, I had killed Uncle Pete. I hate to give a, a, a spoiler, but I'll do this one just to tell the story. Yeah. I killed him in episode four so that Pesci would do it because he said 10 episodes is too much. Yeah. 
And uh, after T- Pesci walked away, I was like, four actually makes sense for him. This yeah. makes sense for the character. <clears throat> this character being such a looming figure yeah. and then dying yeah. is a huge, great thing to do to who's left. Right. Nice void. Yeah. Yeah. Voids are fucking great for tragedy and drama. Yeah. So, uh, so I, so, oh, and then Alan was going to Australia right after episode four. We already had it scheduled at yeah. this point. So it worked out. Okay. But so now, uh, I realize, and meanwhile, the FX deal that I've been putting yeah, together, yeah. where I'm about to sign it, it's final. They're being really nice to me. Yeah. Generous amount of money, right. really decent terms. Yeah. And I realize this is not a little webisode series. Yeah. <laughs> You've got four major I have actors. four huge actors. <laughs> One of their Emmy Award winning actresses, <laughs> Jessica Lang. <laughs> And that's not on FX. Yeah. And I'm about to sign this deal. And that's and I'm in it. Yeah. And I just walked off of the air on FX. And you got to tell them. I was like, this is fucked up. I legally don't have to tell them, but there's no way. You want to have that tension. I can't do it. Yeah. And it was so, I mean, my stomach, was, <laughs> my stomach lining is just, I'm just <laughs> shitting it out. And I'm like, I got to have this conversation. I had it many times in my head. Yeah. And I thought, God damn it, this is not, there's no good version of this. Yeah. You know, for at one point you start trying to say, how can I say this? And then yeah. you go, this is no good way to say it. Right. Um, because I have to make the fucking show. Right. And I have to make it this way. Yeah. I have to make it. I'm not telling anybody. Right. This is all the only way to do it. So I called John Langreff, Um And I said, <laughs> I said, listen, man, I said, I'm about to sign this deal with you. And make it final. Yeah. I need you to know about this before I sign the deal. I didn't ask him, can I do this show? I said, I'm making this show. Yeah. But you need to know it before we sign the deal. Yeah. If And I realize that this is really disruptive, but it's creatively what I believe in. Uh-huh. So I don't have a choice, and I want it. I want to do this. So whatever you do with the deal, I really want to make those shows for you on the network, but... I'll I'll understand whatever you want to do with the deal is I'll understand. Yeah. I hope you decide to sign the deal. Yeah. But I can't have you sign it without knowing about this. Yeah. So he said um well, this is uh this is uh a lot to you need to give me some time to digest this. But you didn't tell him about the show. Oh no, he asked me what's the show about. Yeah. Because I think he wanted to know that I wasn't doing just Louie like, right. on my own network. Right. And I told him it's about a bar and two brothers that own a bar. And that was satisfying to him that yeah. it wasn't the same ground. Yeah. Um and he said, All right, let me think let me think about this. And then he called me like a few days later and he said, Walk me through deciding not to do Louie and then deciding to do this. Like yeah. just take me through and I told him basically the story I just told you. Yeah. And he said, uh, I don't want to get in your way, and I like the work we do together. So let's just, it's fine. <laughs> and I was very glad that I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then I'm writing, and I've got more cast together, and we get the studio. We start talking about what the bar looks like. Yeah. Um, the more and further I went into it, I st- and I'm telling John Langreff now everything. Like I told him I'm killing Uncle Pete. I'm yeah. telling him all this stuff. And after a while, I see him chuckling and going like, listen, Mick, I'm so glad you're not doing this on my... You know, like, it just was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why yeah. would he want to be taken for this yeah, ride? But, right. But, and eventually he said to me, not only am I supportive of this, I, I'm really, I'm rooting for it. Yeah. I, I love... And he, I, I, he was just into that I was doing things this way. Yeah. So, okay. Annie Baker, I called her. I wrote her an email. Yeah. And said, I really love your play. And I thought maybe, because I thought maybe I want help writing this. Because I want to write this with somebody. Yeah. And I also thought, I'm doing this as a collaboration on stage. Maybe I could collaborate when I'm writing it. Right. So I wrote her and I said, Do you maybe want to work on this thing with me? And and, and she was in Iceland. She wrote back and said, Hey, I'm a fan of your work and let's meet. So we met. I gave her the first three scripts. No, the first two. Yeah. And she loved them. And she said, This is really great. And I said, well, will you write on it with me? Like, be a writer on the show. And she said, I don't know if I can do that. And she she went away a bit and thought about if she could write. And yeah. she came back and said, I don't think I can do that. Like, write for you on your show. Right. And I said, I'm glad because I don't think I could let you write on my show. I don't think anybody else could write it. <laughs> yeah. I said, can you just come to my house sometimes and sit with the guy? I have, the way that I use help as yeah. a writer, have somebody sit on my couch and yeah. just be there to talk to. You, who, is, who do you use? Like Vernon? Vernon, Vernon Chapman. Uh, Stephen Wright did it on my episode on my series Louie. Yeah. Um Pamela has done oh, yeah. that for me, Pamela Adler. Yeah. 
Um, on this thing, I didn't have anybody. Ver- Vernon and I had. And Vernon was helping me That's yeah. that way. But so Annie's great contribution to the show was that after two episodes, I decided I want to do an episode where two people talk for the whole episode. Yeah. And you never walk away. And at this point, most of them are around 30 to 40 minute long. The first one was 65 minutes. The second one was 45. Right. So I wanted to do one where it's two people talking. And my first idea was it was two people in the the bar that that aren't connected to the characters. Just like two patrons of the bar talk for 30 minutes, episode three. Right. And Annie and I talked about it. And she said, I think it needs to be... um, people on the show but mm-hmm. maybe you introduce a new character yeah and so i started thinking of that and then i thought of this woman who i met at the emmys also yeah <laughs> who's a brilliant actress i don't want to say her name and i thought she could maybe do it and right. she likes me so yeah. and and i thought what if i think of something for her so i came up with this idea this area and i started telling annie baker this idea the ex-wife the ex-wife yeah and this this thing about a confession and yeah people sharing culpability and you know yeah and and we both were like this is really fucking exciting and it was through through dialogue with annie of talking about it and describing to her the area i wanted to go into and her saying yes you got to do that you got to do that and annie said very early on i feel like this starts with a shot of this woman who's a new character and you don't know who she is yeah and you don't know who she's talking to and and you also like don't even though you know the actress, mm-hmm. it takes a minute to identify her. Oh, uh, definitely. Because she's, you know, dressed down. Well, that's an There's interesting thing. There's no makeup. Because the original actress is somebody you would have gone, boom, you would have known who that is. Right. It, like, it literally through the entire episode, which was, uh, really one of the best performances ever anywhere in my recollection. I think that's true. I do too. And I'm like, is that Lori Mackin? Is it yeah. her? I don't even know if it's her. Who is that? Is it a New York actress? Mm-hmm. Like, I could not identify her that's right for for almost the whole thing until until i saw the credits that's right and and like when you watch that thing i know that i i, I see that other people have responded in similar ways than i have you're like what the fuck mm-hmm. like you, mm-hmm. you know the you can't even explain that performance where it came no. from but you know the detail that you gave her to work with mm-hmm. was was insanely nuanced well, the place I had gotten to with this, like, well, so what Annie and I talked about was the idea of an ex, uh, a divorced couple that have, have a lot of distance. Yeah. Their kids are growing up. They right. have no reason to right. talk anymore. Right. And that one of them did a, I always had this idea in my head that H- Horace did something terrible. Right. To break up the family. Yeah. Just awful. Right. And that she's the victim of that. Yeah. So she is now in her later life doing something terrible in her new family. And also significantly older than you. So the backstory right. of, of you unfolds. Which came because the actress who I wrote it for was older than me. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's interesting to me. That yeah. Horace is um, younger than his wife. And yeah. that that's not a reason, but it's part of what went into the, his not handling the marriage and being a father. Right. He was a young father. Right. And so that idea, and I was like, that, when I started setting that up, I thought she comes to him to ask him how to handle doing a terrible thing because he did one to her. I thought that's fucking huge. And that's where Annie and I were at. And I thought, I know where this is going generally. Now yeah. I'm just going to go write it, send her away. It's the last time I saw Annie on the yeah. project because until we shot the thing months later because she um, had something going on in her life, I, sh- I couldn't get her again yeah. after that. So I sat down and I, she had given me this thought of a woman, the woman's face and you don't know who she's talking to. And I thought, okay, let's let her talk for a while. And so I started telling the story. And this is what it was like to write this show. I sat down and I start telling the story through her voice yeah. of um, where they were at, this house and what it was like and, and you have why no, they and went it, there. It comes out of nowhere. You don't There's, know why she's telling any, the story. You don't know anything. You don't know a single thing. If you're the, watching in order, you're just like, what's happening? The, the power of this show to me and the way I wanted to do it, and yeah. especially once I started writing it, how vital it was that it be a secret was because of the episodes like this where it was like, you won't know why you're looking at this person. You won't know how long you're likely to look at them. You don't know who they're talking to. You don't know how many episodes this show is. You don't know what this show is. It's only two episodes deep into it. You don't know why you're watching it. I, I, I knew that people would call, like we had to, when I first put the show in the air, huge amounts of press called my, my, my publicist who, 
honestly said, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about because I didn't tell him it existed. I wanted him to be credibly ignorant. He had knew no idea. Okay, so right. I mean, when you dropped it, the yeah, day when of, I first dropped right, it. Right. So if you're a person watching this, you're just like you saw one, and you're like, I don't know. What, <laughs> did you, did you send him a nice bottle is? of wine or something? He, he's great. He he handled it very well. Okay. <laughs> and then the second episode, you go, okay, I guess it's, I guess there's a rhythm. Yeah, I guess there's a. It's episodic. The, the it's, first it's, one's like its own thing. Yeah. The first one is like its own play. Yeah. And then the second one is like, I guess we're gonna watch these people for a while. Yeah. It's kind of a holding pattern episode. Yeah. Then the third one, you go, when, wh- who the fuck is this? She's been talking for 10 minutes, yeah. and I don't know who she's talking to, and I'm getting a boner from her story, and she looks really upset and nervous. I don't know why. All these things, the stirring up questions in somebody's head, exciting all their fucking brain with wonder and confusion. These are great feelings to feel from a TV show. Yeah. They don't exist because they want to land you safely in every single moment. Right, you know? right. So this was a great opportunity for that. So she's talking. I'm, I'm writing it, and I'm on pins and needles because I'm watching the scene as I'm writing it. Not for Lori. No, not for yeah. Lori, for somebody else. But I'm I'm in my head thinking about this thing that she's laying there and that he drives up. And, yeah. And and that she spreads her legs open, and, and that was an act. She didn't spread them for him. She spread them for her own uh, luxury of, of aloneness, and that here he comes, and now what do I close them? Here comes this man, this yeah. old man, and I'm letting him look, and do I open my eyes? And every single little detail of that was freaking me out as the I wrote The brush it. on the wall, dude. What's that? The paintbrush. Yeah, the paint. I mean, I, that was like- I lived all these moments as I was writing them. This just the paintbrush, and she's like trying to touch herself, and yeah. uh, I'm like, and I, I mean, I was I was getting hard while I was yeah. writing it, yeah, and and uh, and then I finally get to where Horace goes, why are you telling, why are you telling me this? <laughs> and then the tension breaks, and she goes, well, you know, uh, you I never thought about what what you went through during that time, and, and Horace is like, what the fuck? This is a funny way to bring this shit up. We never talked about it. We just broke up, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I thought, go to the bathroom, Horace. Just go to the bathroom. Everybody, calm down for a minute. And that's where I put. I started putting intermissions in the show. So right. Intermission. Yeah. Come, come back. All right. So, uh, he starts telling her. The real right, truth. And, and you're filling in all this backstory about Horace, about Horace, who you've been watching, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's how you fill it out by listening, that's right. that's and then right. and then by addressing it. But that's even right. all of your stuff is 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 relatively minimal in terms of your in, in your vocal engagement. Yeah, I don't say very much at all. Right, but you you cry, you react, yeah. you listen. Uh, you know, you in and then the episode where you play your own father. Yeah. That that is a completely different set of challenges mm-hmm. uh, as an actor yeah uh, to, and also like how what i always wonder about something this expansive is are you considering the psychology of these characters like when you look at horace as an adult do you, you know from the get-go do you believe he had an abusive childhood or is that something you discover well i think that there was an abuser was the head of the household and, right and that, that was the cycle of the family and, uh, I mean, I grew up with a dad who hit everybody. He just yeah. hit everybody. Yeah. And that's what a family was like when I was growing up. And the mother hit just out of desperation. Right. And the kids had strange relationships of trying to sort of comfort each other and stay away from each other and stuff like that. So I knew that that was a backdrop. I knew that that's part of what drove these kids apart. Mm-hmm. And that's part of what drove Horace and Pete together. But even the detail of... Of the Pete character's childhood with the glasses and the filling of the glasses. Yeah. What? Well, where did that? Where the fuck did that come from? Okay, so like when, that that you're establishing that he had mental mm-hmm. problems early on that had not. It was a big deal to me that Pete had a mental. Uh, um, that he had a, you know, a did a, a disorder. Yeah. And um, I gave that a lot of thought. I talked to a, a guy who works in a, a doctor of abnormal psychology yeah. um to ask to to just run some of this shit by him yeah and he checked most of it he said the stuff that you have there's some that's accurate and the stuff that's inaccurate is is in the right ballpark and borrowing from other types of you know what i mean like yeah. he said it's all it all makes sense right so um pete yeah to me that thing of pete going having this madness that he fights against and that yeah. he really that his nature his nature is that he's just a good guy. Yeah. He's a caring guy. He's he's courageous. Yeah. 
he's vain, you know. He when he says uh, to his date, uh, "I know the left side of my face is handsome," you know, yeah. he he he's got a good heart and strong confidence as a person, but he mm. keeps getting shattered by this fucking madness inside yeah. of him. Yeah, and uh, that's a really hard, terrible thing. It's just a bad toss of the dice. Yeah, and I don't think most people end up beating it in yeah. the end. Right. And I kind of knew right away when I was writing this, I think this shit's going to take Pete. I don't think Pete's going to make it. On right. some level, he's not going to make it. Yeah. And that was really hard because I really got a lot of... I got so involved in these things. Every time I wrote an episode, I, I, I tried not to make phone calls or talk to anybody because I would start talking like the characters right. and stuff like yeah. that. But anyway, so but about the glasses. So um, when I wrote the last... I, the last two episodes, I wrote the first eight. I just wrote them on a schedule, one after the other, because it was just coming out of me. Then I got to episodes nine and ten, and I was, and I knew what they were going to be. I knew what was going to happen in the end. And uh, when I wrote episode eight, where Pete gets some bad news, um, I sent it. I gave the the cast the scripts as soon as I wrote them, because they had a shoot next week. No, no, this is before. I wrote them all ahead of time. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so this is like in October. And it, what, and now, now knowing you and, and, and knowing the stuff that you've taken chances on previous and some of it not being made, how, how impulsive was it? How much editing was there once you, when you did a draft? Well, I mean, when I, when I, did, I would write, I don't do a lot of rewriting in my life yeah, at all, but yeah. I thought I gave a lot of forethought. I thought very carefully about these things before I wrote them. Yeah. I worked harder on these scripts than I've worked on anything yeah. in my life. Yeah. I wrote the first eight. And then I I sat down and thought out nine and ten. Yeah. And when I wrote eight and it, it, Pete gets his bad news, I gave it to Buscemi, who yeah. wrote me and he said, or I think he called me and he said, he said, look, I I I, I don't I don't have high hopes for Pete after reading this. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it doesn't seem like he's got much of a chance in life. <laughs> and uh, after we killed Uncle Uncle Pete, yeah, anything could happen. Right. And I just want you to know that that's okay with me. Because at this point, I thought, we're on season one. This is season one. And, and this he, is also the guy that made Trees Lounge. That's right. That's right. This, this is, is his wheelhouse. Guy, this is a guy who's done... Uh, he's got an incredible body of work. Yeah. So he uh, he said that, and I thought, yeah, I don't know. Because I it was hard to think of, like, I don't want to take this part away from Steve. I don't want to take his character into this terrible place. Because I want to, I'm hiring all these people. They're all taking a chance on me. Mm. Edie and Steve and Jessica and Alan are all, they're giving me of the first quarter of their year, which is a lot from actors of that caliber. And I thought, I want to do this show for years. That's what I originally thought. But as I, every time I took a big dramatic or tragic turn in the show, mm -hmm. I thought the only thing that keeps you from doing that in a sitcom yeah. or any series yeah. is that you need to stay within the margins on a series so that the show stays the same so it can stay on the air. Right. The, the decision to not make big moves on a television show is an economic decision to make more product. Mm -hmm. But as a writer, you just want to be able to say, I don't give a fuck what happens to anybody as long as it's important, as long as it works in the writing. Yeah. So I thought about nine and 10. And I was like, Oh fuck. I know how this, I know this, how this ends. I know what happens at the end. Yeah. I don't want to do it. I don't want this to end like that. I don't want it to, but I have a feeling it's going to, it's going to happen. So I stopped writing. At eight, I said, I'm not going to write nine and ten. Yeah. I want to start making the show and see if I can come up with a better nine and ten. Uh huh. That gives the show a longer life and, and gives the characters a better outcome. Um, so I started making the show and I, once in a while, I'd go back to nine and ten and it just kept. So you're shooting week to week. You're week, doing, you're knocking week. them out in All a right, week. So I've been having people come to my house, the whole cast, they come yeah. to my house and they read. Yeah. The big four. Yeah. And then people like, Mark Norman, Lisa uh, Traeger, who's yeah. just a comic who started at the cellar recently. Yeah. I liked them, so I had them come to read the parts at the yeah. bar. Uh, Lisa, I didn't know what I was going to put on the show. I was like, couldn't you come and read one line but read a bunch of other who? characters? Lisa Traeger. She's yeah. a comic. I never. Yeah. She's just, I like her. Right. Uh, uh, um, um, Michelle Wolf, really funny, strong comic, funny voice. Come on and read this part, you know. And uh, Tom Noonan, who I'd used in my sure. other show, great He's actor, a fucking great actor, got him involved. Stephen Wright, Kurt Metzger. So I started, but there I didn't tell them what they're doing. I said, just come to my house on Monday. And then out of nowhere, we get Burt Young. Yeah, exactly, Burt Young. <laughs> so, so they all come and they sit down at my table, and we all read. And over the whole fall, I read the, the episodes again and again. Read them as much as I could. I had this thing in my head from um, all that jazz. 
the yeah, movie sure. where he's running a dance again and again yeah. and he's like bent over at the waist with a cigarette hanging out of his yeah. mouth he watches them pour their hearts out yeah and then he just goes do it again do yeah. it again and i thought i gotta be that good on this and i did it to myself on the scripts i'd read through them do changes cut little things make it better make it better make it better i just i thought i said this has to be fucking great so i worked like that and then now it's time, when it gets to be uh, January, we've worked really hard. We haven't made anything. We yeah. haven't made a single fucking thing. Yeah. Um, and I try to figure out this workflow. How do we make the show? How do we actually do this? Yeah. How do we deliver the show on a weekly basis? Right. Uh, obviously, I'd left spots. Like a lot of dialogue at the bar was like TBA because I wanted to see what would happen in the news. And we would run that. Like Tuesday, I figured we'd figure out what we're going to talk about. In terms of current events, right? So that's generally what I did. So um, that would run through Kurt, and that's right. Yeah. So we've got five, four cameras and a control room, and I'm the director, and I'm used to directing myself, but the, I need a live switch. I need the cameras to be switching from one to the other in a way that we're going to be able to use on the air. Yeah. So we start rehearsing it, and every time anybody, I'm looking over at the cameras. Every time somebody talks, all the cameras come over to that person, right? And then another person talks, and they all go over there. Yeah, it was fucking madness. And we're not Saturday Night Live people. I mean, they know what they're doing. We don't know how to do it. So I sat in the control room the first week, and I sent the cast home and replaced them all with stand-ins uh -huh. and ran the scenes with stand-ins. Yeah, and I there was these uh, highlighters sitting on. I'm sharing this because I want to open source the show because anybody who wants to do this should be able to do it. Right. Um, there were these highlighters on the uh, counter of the control room, um, all colors. So I had four highlighters, one for each camera. And what I did was I colored the 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 dialogue on the script yeah. with the color of the camera that should be covering that dialogue. Oh, and yeah. I walked through the show. And every time that a camera's position switches, like next to the dialogue, yeah. I wrote, you know, um, a single on Edie. So that's right. what camera one's assignment is. Yeah. And then the next time you see camera one, if that assignment has changed, you go three shot Edie, right. Steve, you know. Right. What, you what, created a, a system. That's right. And I, I invented one. And right. I had so many times during making this show where I thought it can't be done. Uh, the first week, I was like, we can't do this. Yeah. No one can make a show this fast of this breadth. We can't do it. Um, but we figured it out. Um, and after the first one, we realized we all know how to do this now. Right. So working with real pros. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, the actors fucking forget. And when, it. and when did you like whatever skeptical feelings you had about Alan? Oh yeah. So Alan, uh, the first time we read the first two scripts, yeah. I took a bunch of fucks out. Yeah. Cause I thought he's not going to be able to say these things. <laughs> Cause Alan Alda. Yeah. Alan Alda. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he came with a whole other guy and he read it and I was like, this is, I had pins and needles in uh, my body as he read it. And then we read episode two, which I hadn't edited. And uh, he said, fuck and cocksucker and all this stuff. And I was like, you know, this guy's incredible. This guy's like, <laughs> and he was wearing these big glasses and I was yeah. like, God, I hate this guy so much. <laughs> I hate him because we were reading a lot of the scenes were me and him and he's being mean to me. And I'm like, fuck, I hate Uncle Pete. And I couldn't believe it. And I said to Alan one day, I'm not going to talk to you about this character or anything. Just do what you just, you know what you're doing. So, you know, let's just enjoy ourselves. And that's the way it went. I never had to talk to him. About it. I had very few. You always want to be able to help a little. And yeah. direction is a good beacon for people. Right. So I was able to tell Alan sometimes, like, you know, here's a way to go with it. And he would yeah. always be grateful for that. Right. But he invented that fucking character. It's not what I had in my head. It was a something a billion times better. Yeah. And he just, every time he showed up, it was better and better. And the week of the show, when he walks in and, you know, the whole thing I had with music and stuff was about turn on the jukebox in the beginning, let the show feel like, uh, oh, you're watching the show, right? You yeah. don't know what it is. You just got an email from me. This yeah. This is the show. Right. You put it on. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck this is. These two guys are dancing. They look yeah. like idiots. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Wright walks in. Puts a, his own napkin down and gets a drink. It's just dead. They're sitting there drinking coffee. Nothing's going on. What is this shit? And then somebody walks in and puts music on the jukebox. And now it's getting lively. Okay, the place filling up. Okay, so this is going to be a show about a bar, and it's going to always have music coming out of that jukebox. It's going to be live. Yeah. They're talking about football. Right. Uh, and then this guy walks in and unplugs the jukebox, and it plays 
dies. It just this, every it dies, and yeah. then it's dead till he dies. I mean, it's dead like that. And for most of the series, it's dead. Yeah. Um. So that's who Alan was. He was this joy killer, yeah. you know. And yeah. at the same time, I knew there was a time where he really made the bar sing. He made it great, right. you know. He tells the baseball story about Horace. Yeah. It's like this thing. He used to be able to tell stories like nothing yeah, and it's make a horrible laugh. Story. It's terrible. It's so vicious. But, you know, you were able to service a lot of the things that, you know, you struggle with and are important to you. Mm -hmm. uh, cultural conversations mm -hmm. about race, about gender, about sexuality, about politics, uh, you know, about the, the bleakness of life, about how life changes and how people change. I mean, all that stuff is there. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in, in looking at the, the span of it, you know, you, you were able to use Amy Sedaris in almost an angelic way. She was an angel. Right. I, and I didn't know that. I didn't know she was going to be that. Oh, you didn't? No, but, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I didn't service the question you asked me about the, the glasses because I was taking too long to well, get there. It was just there. a detail. But okay. So when I was ready to, I realized I have to write nine and 10 now because there's no escape from nine and right. 10. They are what they are. I realized that 10 didn't have a lot of uh, content. It wasn't actually very much. I yeah. just knew what happens at the end. And then I thought, um, what if we go back to 1976 in Horace and Pete's 2016? 1916, when the bar was open, and now let's go to 1976, somewhere yeah. in the middle. Bicentennial quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, um, what if we go to the day they left? What if we go to the day that Horace and Sylvia were taken away and Pete was left behind? Which is sort of what informs the whole story. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, and then it's... You're playing your father, Edie, your I'm sister's gonna play playing my your mother. She's playing my mother, and Pete's going to play Uncle Pete uh -huh. as a young man. Great job on that he did. He was amazing. So, and then I thought, then when you get a whole new set of bar patrons, and yeah. this time it's fuller and it's more alive. Like yeah. in 76, it was fun. It's not fun anymore. Right. That's what I wanted to, to Active sort of conversation, yeah. not threatening, yeah. not foreboding, yes. not malignant. Immediately I knew George Wallace. Yeah. And then I thought about Colin. Yeah. Colin was great. And I, and I met with Colin and he told me about two hours of stories of New York in 1976 when he lived in Brooklyn at that yeah. time. Yeah. It was great because he said to me, your bar was on Court Street. Yeah. Like he put my bar, he said it was on Court Street near the municipal buildings downtown. And uh, he told me all about having a girlfriend in Trump Village yeah. in yeah. 1976. And so I extracted all this shit from Colin. He credited to him because he told me great stories like the one he tells about gang members yeah. chasing each yeah. other. And I wrote his character. Uh, and then I thought about David Blaine, who I run into once in a while. Yeah. Um, a guy doing a magic trick and freaking out Uncle Pete. Right. Um, and then I thought there should be also an old guy like we had. And then I thought about Burt Young. And I asked my agent, just call Burt Young's agent and tell him we have this. You just sit in a stool and you'll say some shit. I don't want to send him a script. And he said, yes. <laughs> Burt Young, you know, his, uh, his guy's name is Horace and my guy's name is Horace. So he memorized the script. In the and and he thought all my uh, uh, lines were his lines, oh, which was fine, yeah. Because sometimes we both say something at the same time, which is funny, yeah. And also he was better than I. I there was a bunch of my lines. Most of the things that he says, old Horace, were my lines. Yeah. I just let him have them. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so uh, the the abuse, yeah, and the glasses, yeah. So I'm playing this guy who uh, abuses everybody in his family, yeah. And I've never done that, yeah. And I don't know how someone does it. Yeah. And every time I would sit alone, I'd make sure no one was looking and yeah. I'd read the lines out loud and I couldn't do it. Hurt. Uh, well, I thought I can't, I'm not this guy. It was just, I couldn't authentically go like, you know, what are you doing? Right. Like, I'm, I'm what am I going to try to sound like I'm from Brooklyn? Right. What are you doing? What, well, you, you got a little Boston in there. Though. Yeah, a little bit. And so then I thought I might have to replace me. Yeah. And that's weird if I'm the only one not playing right. the older guy. Right. So, uh, then Edie comes to the set one day and we just look at it. She goes, can I ask you about the 76 stuff? And I said, yeah, she was great at talking about the material. So we, I said, let's read it out loud. So now I'm looking at Edie, who I've been working now with for eight weeks, who I've gotten a tremendous amount of respect and affection for who I really love and I believe is my sister from all the time of playing the parts. Mm -hmm. And now I look at her. She's my wife. It's easy to feel that way. Yeah. I love her. I trust her. Right. And I, it's easy to be mean to her. Right. I just go, what are you, what are you doing? You know, you, you, you fucking liar. Yeah. It was easy yeah. because I trusted her <laughs> and I realized that's what abusive people do. <laughs> yeah. They just go, oh, she loves me. She loves me. Fuck her. 
fucking whore. Yeah. It was so easy. It was horrible. <laughs> grabbing her. But I remember when, when we were rehearsing and I was dragging her by the back of the hair uh-huh. through the bar. Mm-hmm. I, f- I was saying to everybody, uh, I'm dragging a national treasure by the back of her head. You know, it was, I felt terrible. But in filming it, it was easy to do. It's brutal. Yes, it is. So then this kid, I thought Pete's going crazy. He's just going crazy at 13. He has no control over it. Mental problem. That's right. Something he gets a thing in his head, he can't get rid yeah. of it. So I thought of this, these two details. One is that he ripped the faces out of some pictures and then mm-hmm. hid them. Mm-hmm. And the other is that he had, he gets told by somebody he's got to fill every glass with water in the house before the sun comes up. That was just a device you came up with. That's all. And then there was this thing, the way the kid did it, of like, you know, he's very good. Yeah. And he's laying the glasses out in rows. Yeah. That kid was so goddamn good. Yeah. I walk up to him and I said to, all I said to him was, when I take my glasses off, you know you're going to get hit. Yeah. Because we did versions where I did a stage slap. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. So um, I take off my glasses and the way he stops uh, is horrible. And then you cut away and just hear no. Yeah. You just hear slapping and no. Yeah. So, okay. Um, Anyway, when we did that and we did the last episode, um, I got really wrecked by it. You know, it was really hard. Well, you could see you getting wrecked throughout it. Yeah. That, you know, it, it started really to hard. chip away at you. That's right. So, like, for me, you know, in my experience of it, you know, and it, it, it's got nothing to do with with who me and you are, but, like, you know, as seeing it as as a piece, I, it seems like you you did some, uh, like, a, a, a version of the, the great American tragedy. That, the, that, you know, you created this masterpiece of, of what, what feels like theater. And and then you you know sort of redefine the parameters of television, but I, I think that does a disservice to what you did in a way hmm. that you shot it you know so beautifully and so specifically that the experience is theater that like you know that the the space and you know you let things sit and this is not stuff that I I know for you is easy. It's not easy for you to listen. It's mm-hmm. not easy for you to cry. That's it's right. not easy for you to to be abusive and like so the challenges of for yourself were 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 huge well they were and the listening is the one is the big one because i didn't make myself cry in any of these scenes uh it's not written when she's telling horace about her son yeah about his son yeah who doesn't speak to him yeah it's not written that he cries there's no reaction written it's yeah. just her lines and when she said them i just bawled i couldn't i couldn't control it yeah and uh on every take we do have three takes but I really lost it when she's telling me about my son who I, and how he's happy. And wait, he's what about man. Laurie Metcalf? Where the hell, did, were you okay, just astounded? So, so, wait, I mean, so, okay, so the woman who I wrote it for couldn't do it. Yeah. And uh, I started thinking of people, and Laurie Metcalf's name kept coming up. And I knew that she was um, a great actress. Yeah. And I wasn't sure it was her. And then I saw a piece from her show called Getting On. Yeah. And I, and I, I saw her do this... I don't remember what the scene was about, but it was just great. Yeah. And I was like, why, why didn't I, she's perfect. There's nobody else that can do it. And then I got panicked because I thought now I'm probably not going to get her. Cause now that I know it's her, yeah. I'm not going to be able to get her. Yeah. This is way back in October before we started shooting. And so I don't remember exactly when, but so somebody got her the script. I emailed her. I tried to get it to everybody personally because yeah. I didn't want anybody to fucking know about the show. So I wrote her and said, please don't tell anybody about this. Please read yeah. it and please do it. Yeah. We can do it on a Monday. She was in a play. Yeah. So she wrote me back and said, I, I'm already memorizing it. Mm. And I said, great. I'm so excited. And I never spoke to her again. Never met her. <laughs> she just took the part. Yeah. And then that was it for that. Then episode three, because episode three was just me and her talking. So yeah. there was nothing to do. Yeah. There was no logistics to it. So, but you had no experience previous to the scene of what she was going to do with it. No idea. No so idea. So were you were just sitting there going, what the Yeah. So, so, so episode <laughs> one, episode two, uh-huh. and putting the show out, mm-hmm. absorbing the reaction from the show, mm-hmm. all of the freakish life of the, all of that. Yeah. Now it's time for episode three. And I'm like, fuck. I got to do episode three now. That's Lori. That's right. Lori's doing it. Fuck. I hope this is good. I don't know. I never talked to her. Yeah. I probably should have brought her in a few yeah. times. So she came the Friday before we shot it. We shot it on Monday. She came in on the Friday before and she sat down and she read it with me. And I thought, Jesus, motherfucking Christ. Yeah. <laughs> this is really huge. Yeah. This is a huge <laughs> thing. 
and I don't, I didn't know it because I hadn't looked at the script. Yeah. I don't know the lines. Right. And she needs me to just catch and throw and toss back. Yeah. It's all I have to do and I'm not ready to do it. Yeah. And God damn it. I didn't know what this was. I forgot about it. Yeah. And when I, when she read it, I was like, she's vulnerable. She's ashamed. She's turned on. She's scared. Uh, God damn it. And I thought this is the biggest thing I ever did is just this one <laughs> stupid dialogue. <laughs> I've never, this is the most important thing I'll ever do. Right. <laughs> and we're doing it on Monday and I'm really tired. Yeah. And so over the weekend, I got as many people as I could get to come over and read with me. I just got, I never, I don't prepare. Yeah. People came over and read it with me. I yeah. had to know it perfectly. I yeah. read it again to and be again there for her. And again, just for her. I, yeah. I got nothing I have to do, <laughs> yeah, but, but not fuck her up <laughs> because she needs to do this all of a piece. Yeah. And the hardest to talk about listening. Yeah. 10 minutes of looking at an actor telling you a story where yeah. you're not on camera, where you're just trying not to derail them. Yeah. So. Yeah, I took all weekend, worked, 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 worked on it. And uh -huh. then on Monday, it was like a closed set, like when you do a sex scene. Yeah. That's what I told the the crew. Yeah. No one unnecessary on set. Quiet. And I set up the shots um, and the sort of game of how to shoot it. And then she came in and then we sat down and it was dead quiet in that fucking place. Oh, Alan Alda coming in at the end. Um, we had shot that already because he left town. Yeah. Yeah, so... We sat down and did it the first take. I figured we'll get a few takes in. First take, we kind of had it. I mean, she kind of nailed it on take one. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, God damn it, Lori. <laughs> okay, let's do one more. Second one, it's far better. Far better. And uh, that's all we ever did in the first half of this episode is one is two takes. And then we the third, we did another one of the second half, the dialogue between me and her. And when she told me about my son being a good man and making good choices, I just, I couldn't, I just felt so many things, you know, and I couldn't hold it in. And that's when this show started to shift for me because I was really getting involved emotionally as an actor without trying. I didn't have to go and think about sad things. I just opened up to these people. Right. And that speaks um, a lot to, you know, you know, your experience with, you know, your mother, and being there for your mother. That's right. And having two fucking sisters. Uh, th like the three. Three. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the amount of, of emotional space and the, the sort of, um, the gift of these characters to the women in this show is, yeah. is sort of mind blowing. Like it's a beautiful thing, but I think that comes a lot from stuff that you really haven't reckoned with publicly. No, it's true. Your I, relationship with women is I, complicated and it's, it goes back to when you were a, a nothing. That's right. A child. That's right. Right. It does. And I think that I was able to dig, dig deep that way right. because it was about family. Right. And here I have this daughter on the show who, uh, it, it, you know, I, I thought about my daughters um, when I did Louie, but this, in this case, I thought about my sisters. Right. Because my family, my dad doesn't, we don't have a relationship with him. Yeah. I don't have one with right. him at all. Yeah. And uh, so that's who Horace's son is, is really me. Yeah. Uh, I'm playing my dad a little bit, you right? Know? And then, um, but my, I have one sister who stays in touch with him. Yeah. And I hope I'm not divulging anything private. But I asked her once because she's has a hard time with him. Yeah. But she stays in contact. Uh huh. And I asked her once, why do you do that? Yeah. Why do you put yourself through it? Because I yeah. don't. She said, "Well, he's part of me. Your parents are part of you." <laughs> and uh, I feel like if I can accept him, not forgive or even like, right? But if I can accept him. And, and be open to him in my life. That means I can accept and be open to parts of myself uh -huh. that I have a hard time with. And I thought, God damn it, that's such a strong choice. <laughs> that's a brilliant thing to be able to do. I can't do it. Yeah. Willfully admit I can't do it. Yeah. I'd rather just avoid and shut down. Right. Uh, so that's who Aidy is. She's really my older sister. Right. And, and uh, that she just goes, look, Dad, I'm going to tell you how I feel. If you want to be around me, you're going to have to listen to what I have to say. Right. Um. But, uh, so that's who she was. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, it was, it, it was very intense. And after three, we, we, then we, then we killed Uncle Pete and the, him telling Pete about eating pussy as his last words was, yeah. uh, 
uh, all Joe Pesci's thing. Yeah, but yeah. he turned it into this thing. Joe Pesci started by telling me you don't eat pussy because it makes you into a schmuck, and even women that do it he doesn't like them. Yeah. Uh, but then he says, but that's because love is love is you face each other and you come at the same time, and nothing nothing is uh, worth and nothing else is, is worth it. Yeah. Hold out for real love. Yeah. Joe Pesci said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> and so. For Uncle Pete to say that to him, don't ever do that, son. Don't ever eat a pussy. And then he shoots himself. <laughs> and I'm sorry for the spoiler for whoever's listening. But that's the only thing you really spoiled. No, that's the one thing. But but, but it, the thing about it is, is like people's expectations of you and, and giving you the, the leeway to, to have this experience and, and put, it, put it out there is that the comedy of it, you know, it, it services the tragedy. Yeah, it, it, does. it does not save it. Like, that's it, very well put. And, and, you, you, know, you know, Kurt's great. Steven's great. Uh, you know, Nick is great. But, you know, yeah, but even Kurt, who is, is probably the most comedic, comedic character. He's also a, lo- a lonely guy in the show, too. Though, right. I think. No, yeah. I know. And, and he's very Kurt. Like, I know yeah, Kurt. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you know, his energy, his exuberance, his joyful cynicism mm-hmm. is, is about the funniest it gets. That's and, it. That's really it. Yeah. That's and, it. and it's dark. It but, is. but there's also one beat that you have, you know, after the first encounter with the uh, with the African American woman who, who you don't know, you know what she is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, when she leaves and you have that moment before you walk in the bedroom, I don't want to give it away because it's right. it's so clearly a comic That's moment. Right. That's right. <laughs> you know, oh, after she leaves, right? And and Edie Falco comes yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so she, you know, here's the thing with that one was a good case of where I didn't. Where this, I felt the story was being told to me rather yeah. than me telling it. Yeah. Because the point of that to me was, um, Horace hooking up with somebody, um, you know, one night stand and the one night stands in life that are very mutually, uh, good. Yeah. And also mutually, um, you know what? Uh, negotiated. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's cool with yeah. what's going on. Right. And that when she wakes up the next morning and goes like, and she's just like, I didn't mean to stay over and horses have some eggs. And she says, and then I'm leaving and horses. Yeah, please do. And then they're able to sit together because they both know no one's going to get snarled but then, here. But then you get into that, that conversation that you have, well, which because, I've never seen it played that way. Well, because I thought what's interesting, once I got them sitting down, I didn't yeah. know what I was going to have them talk about, right. but I thought, here's an interesting thing. Two people who have been intimate, which yeah. means they can tell each other something. Yeah. But they have negotiated a, we are never going to see each other again. Yeah. Which means they can tell each other things right. without fear. Yeah. That's a big deal. Right. And I thought, Horace is a guy who, if you ask him three questions about his life, you find out something terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fucked up way to go through yeah. life. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, you got, uh, I mean, just questions that yeah. are nobody, and they're eating eggs. They don't really even want to yeah. talk. Yeah. Um, uh, you got, uh, are you married? No, divorced. Do you have kids? Yep. Two. Yep. Uh, really? How old are they? And the fucking, then it all comes out. Yeah. You can't even answer that question for Horace right. without this horrible truth coming out. Yeah. And so he tells her, and to me, that's what the scene was about. It was about that. And then I started to figure, okay, well, then we'll start landing the scene by talking about sex and just yeah. that she enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. You have a nice dick. Thank you. You have a nice pussy. Uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's right. I, I, I had to put in where my dick used to be. I had to make that joke. Yeah. Just a joke. Yeah. And then I went, huh? As Horace in my head, I was like, uh, yeah, that's funny. Hmm. Yeah. And then the conversation took off from that. I didn't know the scene was going to be about that. I didn't intend to write that scene. I really didn't. And then once I started having that conversation with myself in my head, about halfway through, I talked to Vernon about it and he said, uh, uh, he said, well, wait a minute, though. If if someone is transgender, they have to tell their partners. And I was like, really? They do? And then I thought, that's so interesting that he thinks that. Yeah. <laughs> that's so interesting. So I had that out in the conversation. Right, right, right. But it, it, I got to give Vernon credit because when we shot that scene, you know, it was intense. Yeah. And the last take we did, I, I thought we were done. Yeah. I was like, we did it. And then Karen Pittman, who played the woman said i'd love one more and i said you don't need one more she said i i don't think i have it at all and i said to her i don't need you to feel satisfied <laughs> like right. as an actor yeah you gave it to me she yeah. said just let me do one more i said all right so we did it that's the one we we used the last one right that she wanted yeah and it's far better than the one previous so uh-huh. she gets credit for that but right before we did it there's something i've started to do 
in directing when I'm in the thing. Yes. Yeah. If you're doing a last take, it feels like a last take. Do yeah. something that the person didn't expect. Like walk towards them when you haven't for five takes mm-hmm. or walk over and like put your hand on their shoulder. Something that makes them do something really honest. Yeah. But anyway, he, he got in my ear and said, you should say this one thing. And he fed me that line right at the, right. Which one? Right before the one you're talking about, the thing I say. Oh, to yeah. Eat. Um, Anyway. Yeah, because it was like, it was like the, in this, in the way yeah. you structured this show, yeah. even if something's funny, you're right. not, you're not writing jokes. There's no, you, it's not. No, there's you know, none. It's all just right. mechanics of the story. And then it's these feelings. And I kept getting blindsided by feelings like in that scene. So Edie wasn't supposed to be in that scene. Yeah. But there was this thing where she's got cancer. Yeah. And there's a timeline to her cancer. Right. And I'd been talking to, to Edie about that kind of stuff. And so oh, I said where to her. She, that, is that the scene where she tells you she has cancer? She, it's the, no, it's the scene where she tells me she's, she's healthy, that she made, that she got a good, a, a card of, you know, oh, that's, right, that's right. That's right. That's right. So I said to her the day before, Hey, you know what? You're not supposed to be here tomorrow for the Karen Pittman scene, but come anyway and come in at the end and tell me that you got, that you're cured. Yeah. And I just figured it's a story point. Yeah. And I'll go, Hey, terrific. Yeah. So, uh, she said, okay, how do you want me to say it? I'm like, just however you would say that. Yeah. That you got good news. Yeah. And she goes, all right. So I forgot it. I forgot yeah. I told her to. Yeah. I honestly forgot. Yeah. Until we're shooting the first, I think we shot, we didn't do any rehearsals of that. Cause when we rehearsed the scene, I didn't have that in it. Right. So we're shooting the scene with Karen Pittman and, um, and that then she's about to leave and Edie walks in and I forgot that I told Edie to be there. Yeah. Even. And then it's like weird because she's there with this woman I was just with. Yeah. And then the Karen Pittman leaves and I go to Edie and she looks weird. Yeah. And I'm really in a real place. Yeah. And I said, what's, what's up with you? <laughs> and she says, I've got good news. And I go, what? She yeah. says, I'm okay. And it fucking hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah. I never experienced something like this. She said this thing to me and I was like, that's my sister. And I was afraid to even consider the possibility that she was dying. Right. And she's going to be okay. And now I'm upset that she was dying. Yeah. It hit me so hard. I mean, I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> yeah. I fucking lost it. Yeah. I just, I just like, <laughs> I started to cry and then I wanted to hug her and I thought, I can't, she's not like that. I can't do it. Yeah. My, Sylvia doesn't like to be hugged. Right. So I just kind of stood there and she stood there kind of gasping. Yeah. And then we hugged awkwardly. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And then that line that, that, <laughs> that Vernon gave me <laughs> was just perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> it was a pretty outstanding line. Yeah. No, it was great. So it that, yeah, that was another, that was another time I got really hit hard. Well, I saw you going through it, but do you feel when you look at this thing and, yeah. uh, you know, outside of, you know, whatever the finances are, none mm-hmm. of that's important to me. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 you know, cause you're gonna be fine. Yeah. So when you look at this thing, yeah. Do you feel like you've exercised something? Do you, are you, yeah, can it, you was, I- it was a big deal. But and- can you identify where, what was this doing inside of you? I don't know, man. I mean, I, I feel like it wasn't just me because we all shared this thing. Right. Every week we would sit down with the new script and we would talk about it and then we'd run through it and we'd go, wow. Tuesday we would just burn through the script, uh-huh. like on the set. Just burn through it again and again. Uh-huh. And then we throw slap on microphones like on our chests and yeah. let the cameras watch us do it so we could start to get a sense of how to shoot it. But so you had a real burned. community. You, you had a family. Yeah, exactly. And I had... Uh, it's theater. These, no yeah, and we're like work, working through it. And starting with not knowing it and saying, what do I say? Like, first we would do it on book. Mm-hmm. Everybody's staring down at the script. So we just are all hearing it. Mm-hmm. But no one's connecting because you're not looking at anybody. You're looking at a script. Mm-hmm. Then you put the scripts down and you read through it and you look at each other. Uh, but then and you have these big moments. But then you see someone just die on camera because they forgot their lines. I mean, not on camera, but we go, uh, uh, what do I say here? Yeah. And then you get peace and through it. And then we go to lunch. Then we come back, put the microphones on. And now everybody kind of starting to know it. And then we would talk about it and go like, wow, this one's really, uh, I'd written them months before. So yeah. it was like, I was discovering each one with the, right, right. With the actors. And then I would be like, uh, all these tracks in my head running at the same time, because it's like Steve Buscemi walks in the room and he starts doing a scene. And I'm like, I'm feeling all these things about my brother. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, God damn it, is this guy turning in a great fucking performance? Yeah. And how does he know all of his lines? Yeah, I don't know yeah. any of my lines. He so gives a shit about this crazy thing I wrote. Um, and he loved it. Him and Edie 
uh, and Alan, all of them loved working on it. And they would tell me this over and over again, that they loved working on it. And then the show would go out and the world would see it, the little world that was watching it. Yeah. And the way that people were expressing their appreciation, most of the people that write sort of like TV um, yeah. recaps were let, were ignoring it. But a couple were recapping it and I would read those. Yeah. And um, I got a lot of emails and I was reading them. I don't read emails. Yeah. But I was reading them because they were all very profound and people were very upset by what they were watching yeah and compelled by it and i thought this is really a fucking big small and big yeah um and it we just all knew we were doing and the bar felt so real to me that fucking bar yeah that amy silver our old friend from the yeah. bartender at the paradise in yes. the 80s yeah she designed it she built this bar that lived for us yeah um and your your guy Paul, you know, was on Paul, it. my guy Paul uh, yeah. Kessner, uh, and 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 the and the big a big thing that happened was the editor because I always edited my own yeah. show, but I let her have it, and she really w earned the job on episode three because she stayed on my face when she was telling me about my son, and I was crying, and when I saw the edit, she doesn't cut away from me once. It's a really long reaction shot, yeah, and I was like, defend that. That's indulgent, and she said. I can't do it any other way. She said, you have to, she said, I, she said every time I watch this, it, it makes me feel all these things. And when I cut to her, I don't feel them yeah. in this one thing. So I, I started this thing I do with an editor now, which is she does something I don't like. Yeah. And instead of saying, change it, I yeah. say, why'd you do it? And she tells me something and I go, well, I hadn't thought of that. And I let her have it. Yeah. So she started shaping how the show feels, but never editing, never shoring up, never shortening moments. Only shifting around where the cameras are because they're all in isolated record, mm -hmm. and uh, and putting the pieces together. You know, I mean, Jesus, Paul Simon making the song for me that made me cry every time I heard it. And then he um, shows up in the last episode. Yeah, he shows up in the last episode, and then the way we used America. You know, Paul, oh, yeah. Paul and I would become pals at that time, and um, he told me he said the sound of silence. Yeah, that Paul Simon said this yeah. to me on your show is really deafening. It's really hard to take. <laughs> <laughs> he said, put a little music in there. <laughs> Make it come out of the jukebox. Yeah. I said, well, I got to get that music somewhere. And he goes, well, why don't you use your favorite song? And he was being nice because I had told him that America is my favorite song. And I said, can I have it? He said, of course you can have it. He gave me America. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, and then when it came down to that, and uh, when Pete had left for an episode and he was gone, there was this episode about Pete being gone. Yeah. I was such a mess that week because I missed Steve. And I was scared for the character. And I was mad at myself for writing what I did about him. Uh, so you're having this very real personal struggle yeah. with the creative, with your creation yeah. while you're acting in it. Yeah. So I don't know why, where it all came from, you know. And I, I, I did something I never did as an actor, which is I resisted feeling anything. I was like, I don't want to feel this. It's too much. Yeah. Like I really did. I was like, I don't care how if the show's good or not. I can't let these feelings out. <laughs> It's wow. too much. Well, well, the personal catharsis of you engaging this way, yeah. you know, and, and having these yeah, I'm sorry I keep going. very real experiences. No, no, yeah, no. It's it great. Was real. The thing that was important to me and one thing about the way I did it was I didn't want to have to tell people, like, I promise you this will be funny. I promise you this will be good even. I just wanted to lay it out there. But the vice. say, if you want to watch it, you can watch it. But all it. these things you're talking about, the life of the show and the life that you lived in it and yeah. these performances and this collaborative experience yeah. and, and the courage of, of making it a tragedy definitively. Yeah, it really is. You know, uh, is, is something that you, it's, it's not, not been done. It's, for me, like, it's a weird thing that my experience is like, this should really, like, this should be two days of theater. Like, you, you should put this up. Right, right. And on Broadway. But that's the funny thing is that this is exactly what it belongs as. It's just this 10 part thing that No, you I know watch. that. I know. I you know. know. But, but, but the, the theatricality of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. To have that experience where you let these pauses happen and you let these, mm -hmm. you know, things be open ended. You let these emotions happen and you let these horrible people, some of them. Yeah. You know, have their time. Well, like with the scene with Laurie, I thought that what I learned from writing that one was that you've got a big issue between two people with a lot of freight ends to it and a lot of conflict and a lot of hurt. And the two of them try to figure it out. And one person says, here's four ways to approach it that could help you. And the other person says, I can't do any of them because I just, I love too much or I'm too scared. Right. And then the other person goes, well, then don't do any of it and just keep doing know, it keep doing it and the other person goes yeah i guess that's what i'm gonna do and kind of fuck you but also how you doing and then just walk away but you needed and, to unload i mean that's a that's a that's a conversation sure 
that's how people talk to each other. Once you've lived a, a lot of life, yeah. especially when you get in your 40s yeah. and 50s and yeah. beyond, yeah. you get to a point where it's like, we can exchange a few words, but we're not going to fix nothing. Right. It's all dug in. Yeah. And, uh, and you never could have fixed it. All you can do is like chat for a few minutes with somebody who's sort of walked the same roads as you and uh, compare notes. I do um, it every week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's it can hurt real bad sometimes. Yeah. And I still I'm I'm like in a weird place of mourning from this show. Yeah. I still like you can see I get like emotional about yeah. it and I I cry about the show a lot. It's a relationship. Yeah, it is. It really is. I miss it a lot, you know? Yeah. And I want to do it again. I can't. I I knew that I, at one point this is a ten act play and it's going to be over. And there's ways we could continue. And I've, that bars in storage. And I've yeah. thought about writing other things. And I might. Uh huh. Uh, you know, this last this kid horse uh, yeah. at the end. Yeah. Um. That's. Uh, I don't know if you know who that was, but that's Angus. Uh, not Angus. Uh, yeah, Angus T. Jones. He's uh, the kid on Two and a Half Men. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's the the boy of Two and a Half. Oh, Men. I didn't know that. Yeah. He's um. He walked off of Two and a Half Men, big, 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 number one show on television for 12 years. Walked off of it because he felt it a uh, moral conflict with the show because mm -hmm. he's a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I found that really fascinating that somebody that walks away from a huge job because yeah. he doesn't feel right about it. And uh, and that made me think about Horace and my show, the kid, this kid who and his son who doesn't speak to him, yeah. who judges him so much that he won't speak to him. Right. Thinks he's such a terrible man that he's not worth his fucking time, his own father. Yeah. Just like I am with my dad. Right. That's who I am. <laughs> and I thought about that and I talked to Angus on the phone and I said, I want you to play a scene. You have three lines. He's in Colorado. I'm like, I want you to fly in and play this one scene. Does he act anymore? Not, I mean, not much. Not yeah. really. And I said, uh, I'm, I, I want you to play a guy in a world that's very amoral, but you're not. In your mind, you're moral. Yeah, and we talked about the idea that when you make yourself moral, you separate yourself from other people because most people aren't. So yeah. you isolate yourself. Uh, and he came and he played that part. So there's there's ways forward with it, and I don't know if I'm going to take them. I may leave it to where it is, but I, I one thing I know for sure is that I'll do something like this again. Right. That's it. Well, that's the important thing. Yeah, I will do something just like this again. For you, sure. You've out, you've outdone yourself, and you've taken yourself personally and creatively to this other level, and you've you've uh, discovered amazing truths. And the only thing that matters to me is that I can keep doing it. And all I need for that is for it to get close, at least, to going, being like it never happened financially. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I'll put it on somewhere like Netflix where a lot of people can see it and sample it. They won't have the experience that other, that they had the people. The saw secret it. people. Yeah, they'll never, no one will ever see it the way they did. Yeah. Until I do it again. Yeah. Which is this, but nobody will ever see Horace and Pete that way again. That you don't know how many you're going to see. You don't know uh, what the next one's going to be. You don't know when you might see the next one. Right. I mean, for the first few weeks, nobody knew it was going to be every Saturday. Yeah, I didn't yeah. promise that. Yeah. Uh, that'll never uh, happen again. Or that something like this would never exist and then it did. That, no matter what I do, I'll never get that back again. I'll never get the thing back of posting it on my yeah. website and sitting and watching Twitter. Yeah. And then sending out the email and seeing Twitter, somebody writes... What the uh, fuck? What the fuck is this? Does anybody get this email? <laughs> what the fuck is this? And I'm like, it's 68 minutes, so they haven't watched it yeah. yet. 20 minutes in, people yeah. are like, I saw the whole thing. It's great. They, they couldn't yeah. have. They couldn't yeah. have. They were just right. that eager to say something. Yeah, yeah. But just to watch the world take it in and it's, it was, was such a fucking prof wonderful thing. It was worth um, all of it. So I'll do it again. I don't need to make money on this. I don't need to. Yeah. You know, I like a lot of people to see it. Yeah. Um, LouisCK.net. LouisCK.net. It's $31. You can just watch the whole season. Just fucking, like, I don't get $31. That's a week of coffee. Yes, yeah, I, I don't not, understand how people prioritize things. They can't, like, can't, you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah, you I don't want to feel like it's fair. This is why. And I understand it now because yeah. I studied this. Yeah. It's not that they feel like that's too much money. I can't afford it. Yeah. It's that they don't want to be ripped off and they want to feel like it's on equity and, and, and let, the thing that they didn't think through, which why would they? Is that I'm on the head of the stream of this thing. I'm like yeah. in the mountains yeah. of the stream. And most shows make their first round of uh, um, revenue on ads. Yeah. Uh, and then by the time they get to Netflix, they've made some profit already. Yeah. Um, but I don't have that. This is, was the first. You're the people watching it. They're the first run people. Right. And that had value to some people. 
and they watched it. Anybody who didn't have value to, I didn't care to convince them yeah. or to advertise to them or promote to them. Right. I could have easily. Yeah. But I thought it's better to let it grow exactly the size that, of people that it really needs. Right. Know, and and also, the, just by nature of it, you know fundamentally it's not for everybody. No, it sure isn't. It would have been a real mistake. To get out in front of this show and say, this is going to be great, it's going yeah. to be funny, yeah. and have billboards and shit like that. And especially because I was coming from a place, this is a weird part of it. I had a show on for five seasons. It was nominated for Best Comedy Series the last three. Yeah. We won a bunch of Emmys over the years. So I realized my the success of my show is going to hurt the next thing I do. <laughs> it's going to hurt it. It can't help it. It's going to bring too many eyeballs and expectations mm-hmm. to it, and especially once I realized what this thing was. Well, but you, so get, you did. I the- thought if I bury it deep in a fucking mountain and it has like a little beep beep signal, like only the people will come to it who are likely to like it. But also, you know, you you, you know you you created the space to allow yourself to grow creatively. You did what an artist does. You you like you know because this business is built on people repeating themselves. Yeah. Even even your show Very good point. Yeah. Structurally, yes. you know, it became pre- not predictable, but it's totally. like there was a stylistic predictability to it. Yep. And 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 that's what made it, you know, what made people kind of like, "Oh yeah, it's Louie." That's right? right. That's right. So, in order to disengage from that you had to disengage from it that's right i had to completely <laughs> right. and, and then start from somewhere so far away from the center and just quietly drop it not even ask people to watch it what did, just tell them it exists yeah, well then i'm not i'm not asking for nothing i'm just making it you guys come if you want well you're the well you're know. the real fucking deal lou oh, i love you mark i love you too you did a great thing buddy and you know that you know there's not many Real artists around, and Jesus Christ, oh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch. There's no, a bunch but of them I, and nobody's paying attention. No, to them. no, but like, but, 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 just uh, you know, I don't want to discredit anyone's art, and I yeah. know there's a lot of real artists. But to be at the statue you're at, and to you know, afford yourself and take the risk to find the freedom to to take a tremendous risk on so many levels, and 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 really insulate yourself long enough and thoroughly enough to do it and execute it. You know, not everybody does that. Well, it's a short life, and. uh uh, if you keep repeating your success, you live in shorter time. Like, in other words, I, you're going to end up looking back at your life in sections. Right. And so, not in years. Yeah. So, for me, it's like the years I did Louis. Yeah. And that's one. Yeah. That's a one thing. Right. Then there's the, the Horace and Pete. That's right. That's one thing. Yeah. If I did Louis for 15 years, that means I got less. Do you understand what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to do more. I wanted to make more. I want to yeah. do a bunch of shows before I die. I'm 48. And most people make it to, you know, 80 if they're good. So yeah. I ain't got that many left, you know? <laughs> I know. I, me neither. I'm having a hard time knowing <laughs> what to do with my mornings. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, like, yeah, exactly. It, like, you know what? It, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting and, uh, and, and, and it's a luxury problem in some ways, given our position. It, it, it definitely is. And I don't know. I don't think it's, but it's an earned luxury. Sure. Because, you know, a lot of people that are coming up, they look at guys like you and yeah. guys like me and they go, well, look what they got. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to, they don't have to worry because look what they got. Look at the opportunities they got. Yeah. We worry all the time. Uh, but, but how did we get to this place? We do have advantages. Mm hmm. And the luxury of some choices. Right. But how do we get those? What uh, did we do to pay into yeah. those? Were we born with that? No. We fucking slogged it yeah. with no hope of get, reaching this. I know. For each of us, about yeah. 25 to 30 years yeah. of just running in place and, and building and, skill. And not knowing if anything was going to work out. Not knowing if it was going to work out and thinking, actually, the odds were very against. Yeah. And you and I both suffer from PTSD from our early careers <laughs> that we're only now <laughs> starting to reckon with. That's an investment and that's a commitment. And it started a long time ago. Yeah. So for me, it's like every time I, I know anybody who's been doing this like like 10 years and yeah. they go, well, it's just not fair. I don't get opportunities. You just haven't hung in there long enough. It oh, takes, I know. Why wouldn't it take years and years and years right. and years 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 to be great? To be a fucking, to get to make TV for a living. What yeah. insane. Right. Payoff. It should take that long. It should take. There'd be that less long. garbage. That's right. That's right. A lot of people get it pretty quick, but yeah. you can tell they got it quick. You can, and then you can see them go away, and then some of them come back. I always love those guys. The guys who get the big breaks, you know, mm-hmm. like like uh, Kevin Hart and Bill Burr, you know, who got mm-hmm. sent up the flagpole, didn't work out. Right. They went back to the grind, come out bigger than ever. That's a real story. If you can get through that, if you can yeah. hit, yeah, and die, yeah, and man. then come back, you yeah. are something. Yeah. That's what Chris Rock did. Chris Rock did yeah. uh, uh, SNL, yeah. 
that's the biggest break you could ask for at the time. Yeah. Fucking stunk. Yeah. On SNL. Yeah. During a time where SNL stunk. Yeah. And then he disappeared. And that was like, that's what yeah. happened to Chris Rock. Yeah. And then there was, I think you might have been with me when he came to Caroline's to headline for yeah. an hour. So we went, oh, let's go watch Chris Rock do an hour. Yeah. And, uh, and, and like, I mean, well, we're shit. like, we're sitting around New York, like, uh, why doesn't somebody give me something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I got, funny. Yeah. I got 20 funny. I want to do Letterman. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, we, we sat in the back and watched him do an hour. And at the end of the hour, everybody's on their feet. Yeah. And we're, all the comedians are bent over with their heads in their hands going, what the fuck am I doing with my goddamn life? Right. God damn it. Is that guy good? So he, you know, he, yeah. you know, but yes, yeah, so the, 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 the hitting and then dying and, well, I'm fortunate in that I'm, I'm still waiting to hit, which is a great feeling. You have hit. You've, I'm kidding. I'm you, kidding. I'm you've kidding. offered There's something. There's build. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. I love you. Go do love your shows. Too, man. Thank you. 